Hello, folks. Welcome to Humanity Now podcast. Today we're in Eleanor Finley about Murray Bookchin. Eleanor, hi, Eleanor. Welcome to Humanity Now. Can you please start by telling the audience a bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure. My name is Eleanor Finley. I'm a PhD student in anthropology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where I study democratic social movements. And from 2012 to 2017, I was a very active member of the Institute for Social Ecology, uh, which is still active today and I'm still, um, still connected to them. Uh, the Institute for Social Ecology was founded by Murray Bookchin and his friend Dan Choderkoff in 1974. Uh, so through that experience, I got to work with some of Bookchin's close students and collaborators. I currently live in Milan, Italy, where I participate in a variety of projects um, and democratic movements. And I'm also working on a book presently about social ecology and its praxis called Practicing Social Ecology that's forthcoming uh, through Pluto Press. And uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, this sort of about me. Something I should say before we move on is that I'm uh, I'm an anthropologist, but I'm not a historian or a biographer. So uh, I have some insights and facts into Murray Bookchin's personal life, uh, but I would certainly fact check anything uh, through folks like Debbie Bookchin, Murray Bookchin's daughter, who manages his estate and is also a journalist by training. So I would sort of consider her the foremost authority on Bookchin's biography uh, and you might also look at the writings of folks like Janet Beale, um, who wrote a memoir biography uh, about Bookchin for Oxford University Press, although aspects of that characterization are um, disputed. Uh, and uh, finally, you might look at folks like Andy Price, Damian White, or Marcel van der Linden, who have written about Bookchin's uh, life and work in the past. Great, thank you. Uh, can you please give us a quick general background on Murray? Of course. So Murray Bookchin was a social and political theorist from the United States. He was born in 1921 and lived a very full uh, revolutionary life uh, until the age of 80, 85, I believe. Um, and he, he died in 2006. And he, Murray Bookchin was a central figure in the radical ecology movement uh, starting in the 1960s and moving through the, the 1990s. And he's a central figure in 20th century American anarchism. So that's all to say that he participated in and helped lead a number of very important movements in the United States, uh, in particular, the New Left movement of the 1960s, the anti-nuclear movement of the 1970s and 80s, and the Green Movement, which became the Left Green Movement. Murray Bookchin was also principally an author who wrote at least 24 books and countless articles on the theme of social change, revolution, and humanity's place in the natural world and our relationships with each other. He was a talented orator who traveled the world sharing his points of view and uh, also wrote several significant historical works about the Spanish anarchists of the 1930s and the 1871 Paris Commune. What we'll be talking about here today, I imagine, is the radical philosophy that he authored called Social Ecology. 
uh, which crucially includes a political dimension rooted in direct democracy and a principle of federalism. And so when we talk about social ecology, we're also talking about a movement that's deeply committed to direct democracy. What was his youth like? Bookshin was raised in the East Tremont neighborhood of the Bronx, which is situated between Cortona Park and the Bronx Zoo. Uh, he was largely raised by his grandmother Rose, uh, as his father really wasn't in the picture and his mother was often struggling with mental health. Uh, his family moved around quite a bit. They were housing insecure. But as I mentioned, Murray Bookshin was born in 1921 and he was raised in the East Tremont neighborhood of the Bronx, which is situated between Cretona Park and the Bronx Zoo. Uh, his mother struggled with mental health so he was largely raised by his grandmother, uh, Rose. His grandparents were Russian-born Jews who came to the United States fleeing pogroms. They were also militant socialists, uh, which is to say that they raised Murray in a committed revolutionary environment. He joined the communist youth at the age of nine and was distributing newspapers and acting as a street orator uh, at that very young age. Uh, he was actually uh, well, well known as a talented street orator uh, as a child, kind of a child prodigy uh, in, that, in that regard. Uh, this was also a female-centered household. Uh, I don't know exactly um, when his grandfather uh, was sort of out of the picture, um, but he was really raised by his mother and his grandmother, and they moved around quite a bit. Um, they were, uh, you know, working working people, working class, uh, and were renting apartments, and um, and had a very strong sense of class consciousness. Uh, some years ago, I actually had the opportunity to see one of the homes that he lived in in East Tremont. And uh, I was sort of struck by this environment. Um, I noticed that this is now a very poor neighborhood. Uh, it's heavily policed. Uh, there's high uh, infant mortality rates and uh, maternal mortality rates. And uh, you could really see how the environment of this part of the Bronx would have influenced uh, someone like Murray Bookchin to be interested in ecology uh, because the, the, the air quality in, in this part of the Bronx is very, very low. Uh, and it's just one block away from the Bronx Expressway. Um, so I thought that was actually very interesting uh, that these ecological issues are very much uh, starting to ferment uh, in the place that he was raised uh, at that time. Uh, the, I mentioned that his neighborhood is very close to Cretona Park, which is a large park. Uh, so this is actually a large green space where he would have been able to go as a young man uh, also as a street orator and a young communist who is involved in his community. Did he go to university? He did not go to university. He worked as a foundryman and a union steward for most of his life. He did eventually become a professor at Ramapo College in New Jersey, but at that point, in 1974, he had already established himself as a leader on the New Left and had published several books. And he was offered that job really on the merits of his writings. Uh, but he grew up in an environment where he did not have the opportunity to uh, pursue higher education. 
uh, but was nonetheless able to um, uh, spend his life as an intellectual. Great. What were some of his most important ideas? What social ecology and how did Bookchin help promote it? Mm -hmm. So to understand Bookchin's ideas is to encounter a particular vocabulary that is totally new for most people. And that vocabulary includes some of Bookchin's own uh, original inventions, as well as a unique use of concepts developed by other thinkers or taken from disciplines like anthropology or critical theory. His most famous and most developed concept is social ecology, as you just mentioned, which is the idea that our present ecological crisis is rooted in the problem of social hierarchy, which is to say that social hierarchy, uh, permanent systems of obedience and command are not natural states of affairs. In Bookchin's view, social hierarchy is a historical problem. And until now, that problem has been largely contained to the realm of human affairs, that is, social hierarchy has caused suffering for people, primarily. But today, we are now seeing that problem spill out onto a global and planetary level. When we say that social hierarchy is a historical problem, we don't mean that uh, that social hierarchies um, are not a common part of the human experience, but, but rather that egalitarian and non-hierarchical or horizontal societies uh, have existed and persisted throughout human history uh, as long as we've, as we've been here. And it's really not until recently that a hierarchical society like ours, one that is characterized by a state, by strong patriarchal relationships, by economic and financial elites, that it's not until recently that a society like that has been durable and stable and now been able to sort of impose itself uh, on humanity as a whole species. So this is really what's at the core of social ecology, but it's a fully developed philosophy. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to talk about uh, more aspects of that philosophy, but today, but probably not all of them. Um, so that's a little bit about social ecology. Some of Murray Bookchin's other key ideas include communalism, Communalism is the political dimension of social ecology. So if we say that hierarchy is a problem and that it's not inevitable, human beings don't have to live in hierarchies, we have to ask ourselves, what comes after hierarchy? Or what can we do instead? So Bookchin's answer to that problem was communalism. And communalism is in this way an elaboration of ecological principles in the political realm. It means uh, enacting principles of interdependence, of mutual aid, and that those principles are enacted through direct democracy and federalism. Communalism is a political philosophy committed to the practice of direct democracy. Uh, direct democracy meaning communities coming together on a very small scale, on a neighborhood scale or a level of a town or a village, 
uh, to make decisions about the issues that affect their everyday lives. And that these communities can come together to be autonomous, self-governing, and also to come into a relationship of interdependence with neighboring communities. Uh, so communalism isn't just about uh, small is beautiful. It's about creating a, an interdependent world of free communities that have general autonomy, but are working together uh, in a way that power and decision making flows from the bottom up rather than the top down. Awesome. What is federalism? Hmm, federalism. Federalism is a principle by which free autonomous communities work together rather than one community dominating the other or controlling the other. So federations have existed throughout human history in many, many parts of the world. The Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, otherwise called a, the Iroquois Confederacy, in the American Northeast is one of the most uh, well understood examples, one of the most famous examples. And through the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, there were five main tribal groups who were federated together. And uh, from within each tribal group, there were uh, subgroups. And each of these groups were self-governing but would collaborate on the issues that affected them mutually. So to give an example, one village uh, could federate with another village that lies along the same river basin. And these two communities trade with each other. They have social ties and they might come together, federate, to discuss uh, the river that they, that they mutually share. Um, in the United States, we are a little confused about the meaning of the word federalism uh, because in the American Revolutionary period, uh, the capitalists who wanted to construct a new state uh, in the aftermath of the American Revolution called themselves federalists. Uh, thus, we have a federal government today. Um, but in fact, what they really wanted to do was to take away power from the various colonies and create a centralized government. Uh, it's actually a very interesting kind of propaganda twist uh, that happened uh, in that time. Uh, but federalism means autonomous, self-governing communities uh, linking together on matters of mutual interest and also ethical principle. Excellent. <clears throat> what is Menince Apalyism? Mm. Instant. Municipalism, yeah. <laughs> Municipalism is a mouthful, <laughs> first of all. Uh, it is a part of Murray Bookchin's communalist philosophy hmm, that is sort of tailored to our present situation where we live in states and we live in capitalism. So it's all well and good to say that we should do away with hierarchy, we should come up with a new system of governance based on direct democracy. Um, but how do we do that from where we're sitting right now, where communities are very disempowered and um, there are very few competencies at the local level. And there's very little engagement in politics uh, aside from national elections. So libertarian municipalism 
refers to the project of getting ordinary people involved with politics at the grassroots level so that we build a movement towards direct democracy in the political institutions at the local level that we already have. Libertarian municipalism is the project of building a political movement to enter your local uh, municipality, your local town hall, and to advocate for direct democracy in that space. So Murray Bookchin theorized or envisioned a political movement around the world where people would be entering their institutions of local governance, advocating for direct democracy, and ultimately creating a movement with popular legitimacy that could take away power from the state that ordinary people could ultimately demand to have decision-making power over their everyday lives. So we would reclaim the commons uh, through the municipality. To, so libertarian municipalism really is, is that project of reclaiming the municipality from the state uh, on behalf of the people. Wow. Thank you so much. That's a great explanation. Um, does that have anything to do with dual power? Mm. Is that a term that he used? You know, it's a term that a lot of social ecologists use, and it is a term that he used, though not widely, I believe. This is something that somebody else might be able to fact check me on. I believe that he first talked about dual power in the book Post-Scarcity Anarchism, which was published in 1970, or maybe 1971. Uh, it's a collection of essays from his writings during the 1960s. And dual power originally derives from Lenin and the Russian Revolution. So as you and your listeners may know, the Russian Revolution was divided into two periods, uh, the February Revolution and the October Revolution. Uh, so there was this uncertain period when the czarist regime had collapsed uh, in, in, by February, and a intermediate government was established to, to govern. And at the same time, the communist movement was very strong, or the socialist movement in Russia was very strong, and the Bolshevik party in particular was active in organizing Soviets, uh, organizing popular power uh, against the provisional government. So for a time in Russia, there were two governments, one, run by the Bolsheviks and other socialists, and the other run by the what remained of the imperial state. So Lenin called this situation dual power, where a revolutionary movement is in a contest of legitimacy with the old regime. So Bookchin used the concept of dual power to talk about what we needed to do. How were we going to achieve widespread social change? It's, again, all well and good to say that we want this new world, uh, but then we're really faced with how do we bring it about? Some people think we should have a violent revolution, uh, just a, a, a period where all at once we, we seize power um, from the government and then try to recreate a new world uh, in, the, in the aftermath of, that, of those events. Um, history has shown that those kinds of situations can often go very badly. 
Mm -hmm. And what we need is an organized presence that's preparing for a new world, a new way of doing things. And that that new way of doing things has to be based in popular legitimacy. This is sort of the crucial concept within dual power is that it's, it's based on building legitimacy from the grassroots. So Bookshin used this term, um, but I think it was really popularized in the social ecology movement by his student, Haya Heller, who has also been an important mentor for me. Uh, she has taught Bookshin's ideas at the Institute for many years, and it was through her teachings that I first encountered dual power, uh, as well as through her book, The Ecology of Everyday Life. Uh, she uh, elaborated this concept of dual power into, um, into a social ecology movement that has a minimum transitional and a maximum program. I mean, this is also sort of coming from Lenin, uh, but she applies it in a social ecological context. Uh, what it means to have a maximum program of, of direct democracy. So that's a bit about the history of dual power and how it's used in the social ecology movement. Again, it doesn't originate with the social ecology movement, uh, but we do use it in that way. And it comes from Bookshin, but also from Bookshin students. Excellent, thank you. Um, you've mentioned that Bookshin went from being a communist. You also mentioned anarchism. What was his mm -hmm. overall political evolution as he grew, grew up and got older? Mm -hmm. Bookshin has a fascinating and rich political evolution. As I mentioned, he was born into a communist household, which in the 1920s and 30s uh, really meant so a strong support for the Soviet Union and, excuse me, and particularly later on, Stalin. Um, but that was, again, just sort of common sense in that period. Uh, he was a part of the Socialist Workers Party in the 1940s and was eventually expelled for opposing Stalin's pact with Germany. Um, so really, even in his youth, he's beginning to question communist orthodoxy. In the early 1950s, he began to study with another social theorist who was challenging those same orthodoxies. This man was, uh, his name is Joseph Weber. He was a German uh, Trotskyist who fled Germany. Um, I found conflicting accounts. Uh, I've, I've read that he was fleeing to escape the Holocaust, others that he was escaping um, the, uh, you know, escaping uh, the aftermath of the Spartacist uprising in the 1930s. Uh, but in any case, Joseph Weber had been a part of um, sort of the German communist circle, um, really led by Rosa Luxemburg and communists who were, in a sense, less authoritarian uh, than than Leninists. Uh, Joseph Weber became a Trotskyist and then even eventually uh, decided that he Weber was a Trotskyist, uh, but eventually uh, realized that even Trotskyism was not far enough left or was not liberatory enough. By the time he settled in the United States, he was developing his own ideas about liberation and consciousness and human evolution. He was cognizant in a very sort of early way about the environment and nature. And he hosted a group called Contemporary Issues that Murray Bookchin was a part of 
during the 1950s. I think he started in 1951 or 1953 um, and studied with Joseph Weber un until his death. Um, so this is kind of a transitional period for Bookshin. He's in a post-communist moment where uh, books are coming together. They don't have, um, they're not clear what that new ideology is going to be or what that new philosophy is going to be. Uh, but they know it's not going to be pu purely Marxism. They saw that there were deep flaws with Marxism that needed to be worked out. Uh, so that's sort of the first turn is from communism to this post-communist uncertain uh, future. In the early 1960s, Murray Bookshin began to subscribe to the anarchist movement. He moved from the Bronx into the Lower East Side in 1963 to join the anarchist movement that was thriving there at that time. So this is now his second sort of ideological shift. He started moving closer and closer to, to anarchism and, um, and becoming a part of the new left, and in particular, the liberatory elements of the new left. And this anarchist movement was particularly interested in the liberation of culture and the liberation of thinking. And as I've mentioned before, interested in, in a commitment to ending hierarchy as such, not simply class, not simply capitalism, but the very notion that some human beings are superior to others. So that's sort of his, you know, let's say his second major period uh, was as an, as an anarchist that uh, lasted from the early 1960s until the late 1960s. Uh, by the late 1960s, he is even beginning to question anarchism and wondering what is the concrete practical dimension of anarchism? What does it mean to have an anarchist society? What are anarchist institutions? And at this point, Bookshin really starts to branch out onto his own. And he begins through his writings, through his research, uh, particularly through historical research into anarchist history, cultivate his own idea of what he calls libertarian municipalism, which is to say he arrived at direct democracy as the, I wouldn't say the answer, uh, but in a way, yeah, the answer, you know, uh, what does, what does society look like without hierarchies? Well, if you look uh, at anarchist movements throughout history, uh, peasants, uh, peasant rebellions throughout history, and crucially, uh, and this is where, you know, my, my own sort of interest lies and where I think we have a lot more to learn. Um, if you look at indigenous history and indigenous practices around the world, you see that direct democracy comes up again and again as the way that people organize themselves uh, without having to have systems of superiors and inferiors, uh, obedience and command. So by 1972, Bookshin is moving to Vermont where there is a rich history, a living history of direct democracy at the local level and, um, and also to a certain extent uh, at, a, at a federal level, meaning that Vermont's history of direct democracy includes towns that are uh, that are working alongside one another that 
uh, have uh, have these kinds of federal networks. So Murray Bookchin became particularly fascinated in that history of what's called New England town meeting. And he decided to move him, himself there, his family there, and also sort of his close circle of students and, um, and collaborators. Uh, they decided to move to Vermont to focus on building a new kind of political project. And, um, and so that's what they did. And Bookchin spent the rest of his life in Vermont, uh, in, I think, Berlin. He lived in, anyway, uh, he moved to Vermont in 1972 and spent the rest of his life in Burlington as a part of left, so uh, libertarian socialist and libertarian municipalist movements. Um, so this is sort of the, I guess now the third <laughs> transition in his thinking. And he lived those ideas through the anti-nuclear movement and particularly through the green movement. By the 1980s, the green movement had started to thrive in Germany uh, in conversation uh, with with anarchists like Bookchin and his his former wife, B. Bookchin, had gone to Germany and observed the Greens and came back to Vermont and said, "Hey, we should start a group. We should uh, we should make our own uh, Green movement." And so that's what they did in 1986. Uh, B. and Murray and a close Circle established the Burlington Greens. This was the first, effectively, the first chapter of the Green Party in the United States. Now, obviously, they never wanted to start a party. That was never their their intention. Uh, but the Green Movement began in the United States uh, through Bookchin and and his circle. And the Burlington Greens worked on civic issues in Burlington throughout this period. They crucially worked hard to preserve the city's waterfront against privatization uh, from the city's mayor, whose name you might recognize, Bernie Sanders. And they worked on a variety of other civic issues, uh, like reclaiming buildings for public use to create community centers mm -hmm. instead of uh, you know, instead of condominium developments, they also struggled against uh, Sanders' program to manufacture arms around Burlington, to have a weapons manufacturer, manufacturer in Burlington. And they followed a libertarian municipalist program of entering the Burlington town hall and advocated for the creation of direct democracy. In, I got, I forget what year exactly, I think it might've been 19, 1990, uh, they, they, ran, uh, they ran a candidate. Actually, I think they ran a candidate in 1987 as well. Um, in any case, they, they ran candidates on the platform that that candidate would dissolve the powers of the mayor into a directly democratic body. And at their height, I believe they got 12% of the vote, which wow. is actually quite impressive uh, if you think about it. Uh, I can't imagine another anarchist movement in the global north that is able to rally 12% of the, the local population. Uh, but they, but they succeeded in that. And, um, and that was how they were sort of living their libertarian municipalist uh, values. Uh, the last major movement in his political thinking is 
in the development of communalism. So libertarian municipalism, uh, as I mentioned earlier, sort of this project, but by the 1990s, he was interested in how that project could be elaborated into a full political philosophy. So uh, communalism is sort of the new term that he used to describe his thinking. And communalism was meant to be a little bit more expansive than libertarian municipalism. And communalism really refers to the overall way of life uh, within such a directly democratic community. You know, what does it mean to be a citizen in a directly democratic community? What does it mean to enhance nature as a human community? In what ways can we make nature a part of our democratic community? These are all questions uh, that go into his thinking about communalism as, as a philosophy. So that's a little meandering, but that's a sort of a summary of his political development. He started out as a communist. He gradually became an anarchist in the 1960s. And then by the 1970s was developing his own theory of politics rooted in direct democracy, which he remained committed to until his death in 2006. Wow, that's excellent. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I want to back up a little bit mm -hmm. and talk about mm -hmm. book, Bookchin's relationship with Cornelius Castoriadis. Mm. Do you, can you read that, please? Mm. I, I can't. I, I don't know much about their relationship. I know that they were colleagues and, and I think friends at one point. They were writing in the same publications and they were thinking about the same questions. Obviously, they uh, were both thinking about autonomy and direct democracy and they, sh they share a similar evolution. Uh, a similar trajectory and movement towards direct democracy. Uh, they both published in a publication called Democracy and Nature. Uh, this publication has several iterations, so I might be giving the uh, one of the titles that's less well known. I think there's another Democracy and Nature, and then it might be Ecology, Democracy and Ecology. Anyway, Democracy and Nature. Uh, it's a publication that they were both writing for and concerned with similar issues. But I personally don't know much about their personal relationship. Okay. Thank you. Um, did Butchkin know about CLR James? Ooh. Yes, he did. Butchkin was certainly aware of CLR James. Uh, they were, I think, also in a kind of loose conversation with one another. But as I understand it, again, I'm not a biographer or a historian, uh, but as I understand it, they did not have a direct personal relationship. I think he had a lot of respect for CLR James, mm -hmm. and there are CLR James students who have been a part of the, the Institute for Social Ecology. I, I don't think he's with the Institute anymore, uh, but Lincoln Van Sleutman is a student of CLR James, who is a, was a part of the Institute while I was there, and you know a, a, close, a close friend of the Institute, and, and sort of really sort of very much a social ecologist. Um, but you know, you mentioned Cornelius Castoriadis a minute ago, like CLR James, Bookshin uh, shared with him that interest and movement towards direct democracy. The Institute also at times has taught CLR James as well, uh, particularly his pamphlet, Any Cook Can Govern is an important text uh, that I was exposed to at the Institute. Excellent. 
Um, I want to ask you a question. Did Bookchin address the race question in the United States at all in his writings? <clears throat> he did, although I think many folks would understandably uh, say maybe not enough. Murray Bookchin writes in passing about anti-racism. He was a committed anti-racist and an activist in core anti-racist organization and affinity group uh, based in New York. Um, and he wrote particularly about environmental racism and was concerned about environmental racism. As I mentioned, he grew up in the Tremont neighborhood in the Bronx, which is a, which is very deeply affected by environmental racism. And as a Jewish person, obviously he was keenly aware of the destructive powers of racism, uh, not only in general, but also in its environmentalist form and expression. So he was not often using the language of anti-racism that we're familiar with today, but he pursued very passionate debates with deep ecologists and folks in the radical ecology movement who were smuggling in racist ideas. Uh, there was a period in his work in the late 1980s and early 1990s where he argued very passionately against deep ecology. Deep ecology, uh, meaning the, the idea being that human beings need to listen to mother nature, that uh, we are destroying the earth and that we need to submit to the will of nature. He was extremely critical of these ideas and argued for a humanist ecology. Um, but he was not writing or thinking specifically about the social fracture of race and racialization and white supremacy and how that plays out in a dialectic of, of hierarchy globally. There are three books that stand out in my mind, and I think in many people's minds, as Bookchin's most influential and significant. The first is Post-Scarcity Anarchism, published in 1970. This is a collection of essays that he wrote throughout the 1960s, and is the place where he really makes the case for an anarchist society, one where we tackle hierarchy in general and not just capitalism in particular. The second major book and arguably his most important book where, you know, the book where he really lays out his philosophy in the greatest detail is called The Ecology of Freedom. And The Ecology of Freedom was published in 1982. And it's where he, The Ecology of Freedom is where he lays out a historical dialectic between hierarchy and freedom. So he makes an argument that freedom and our concept of freedom has come about through a historical engagement and struggle with unfreedom. And moreover, that there is an ecological basis for freedom. There is a rootedness of freedom and humanity striving for freedom in natural evolution. He does all of this and much more in the ecology of freedom. The third truly you know, the third of his most important books is Urbanization Without Cities, also titled From Urbanization to Cities. That was first published in 1992. 
And this is where he really makes an argument for municipalism and the location of a revolutionary politics at the directly democratic level. Um, another really important book uh, that has been published actually recently, uh, that was published posthumously, is called The Next Revolution. And it's a collection of unpublished essays uh, from, from Murray Bookchin uh, on, that, was, that was edited and published by, by his daughter. Um, earlier, you asked what books I would recommend by Bookchin. Um, I, if you are brand new to reading Murray Bookchin's ideas, I highly recommend The Next Revolution. I also recommend another book called Remaking Society. Remaking Society is not his most famous book. Uh, it's, it's actually not referenced very often in his biography, but it's the first one that I read, and it transformed the way I saw the world. It transformed how I saw myself in the world, and it's, it's quite short. And that's what I really, really liked about Remaking Society. The Ecology of Freedom is, is like a 700-page book. Uh, the Next Revolution is really a collection of essays. Urbanization Without Cities is similarly, I think, 400 pages, something like that, 300 or 400 pages. Whereas Remaking Society is a short 100-page book that I think anyone can pick up and read and feel inspired to change the world by. Excellent, thank you. Um, I wanna ask you about this institute. Is it still in existence and how can people learn more about it? Yeah, the institute is still going. It's one of the oldest, uh, it's one of the oldest continuously active institutions on the left in the United States. As I mentioned, the Institute was founded in 1974. They have educated thousands of students from around the world over the years. They are based in central Vermont, uh, in Plainfield, Vermont. Uh, for many years, they had a campus. Uh, and actually, for when they were first established in 1974, they were associated with Goddard College uh, and then transitioned to having their own campus. Presently, they do not have a physical campus, but they offer a lot of classes online uh, that you can take to learn about social ecology, communalism, as well as social movements and the history of the left. And you can find them at social-ecology.org. The Institute is, is very much still active and you can learn more from them uh, and study with them just, just as I have. Great, thank you. Um, one last question, mm -hmm. and uh, you kind of answered it before, but maybe we can just highlight it again. What can mm -hmm. we learn from Butchkin to help unite humanity and heal the people and the planet? Mm -hmm. uh, I really like this question. Uh, so my, my answer is everything I just said uh, that Murray Bookchin's ideas that he committed himself to and his, his truly brilliant mind to for many decades, uh, the, the question that he committed himself to was how can we help unite humanity and, and heal the planet? So everything I just said, I think we can take away from Bookchin. Uh, that being said, I think there are two primary lessons that, that we can take away from his story. And the first is that we need to start taking seriously the task of creating new political institutions. I think we're kind of, we're scared of this. And understandably, especially if you've never lived in a society that has self-governance, if you've never practiced self-governance before, it can feel like this big blank area and it's an easy place to project a lot of fears. 
but I don't think we should be afraid of it anymore. Uh, I think we need to really think concretely about the kinds of institutions that are going to liberate nature and liberate human beings and provide an alternative to capitalism and the state. Um, because we can create all of the cooperatives or organic farms and other ecological projects that we want, but unless we have the popular power necessary to protect those projects and to implement them on a wide scale, we're never going to make progress. So I think the first lesson we can really take from Bookshin's story is to think seriously about what liberatory governance looks like. What does anti-racist governance really look like? What does indigenous governance really look like? What does feminist government look like? Uh, what does queer governance look like? Uh, what are the kinds of institutions that we can use to manage our everyday lives and uh, implement a world that is socially just and, and free? The second lesson that I think we need to take away from Murray Bookchin and folks like him is to start to develop a really clear understanding of who we are and where we come from as a species. I'm an anthropologist, so this reflects some of my personal biases, but I think Bookshin shows that so many of the problems that seem inevitable or inescapable start to look a lot more manageable when we look at the whole history of the human species and the whole range of the human experience. As I mentioned again, I think we, especially in the West, uh, especially in uh, settler colonial contexts, that we really need to be looking to our indigenous brothers and sisters and how they have been doing things uh, for, for many generations as an example of, um, of what uh, governance can look like, as well as, as what's, what civilization can look like. Uh, in Western context, we struggle to imagine what civilization could be like without the state. We think that society cannot be complex without the state. Uh, but for indigenous people around the world, life without the state is a very easy thing to imagine. And these ways of life are not simple. Uh, the idea that indigenous ways of life are somehow primitive or, uh, or simple or small uh, is really a myth. And when you start looking at indigenous history, the ethnographic record, and once you start deconstructing these uh, Eurocentric and state-centric narratives, uh, you see that there are so many possibilities for how we can have a civilization that is technologically sophisticated, that is culturally rich, and at the same time, ecological and, and decentralized. So uh, I think that's the second lesson to take away from folks like Bookshin, uh, as well as thinkers like David Graeber and David Wengro with their recent publication, The Dawn of Everything, which, which looks at society's prehistory as well as how we think about prehistory and uh, deconstructs some of the myths that we tell ourselves uh, about ourselves that uh, really only serve to keep us limited and kind of imprisoned in this way of life. Uh, so that's, that's something I also take away uh, that we can, um, we have to start understanding the broad strokes of our own history 
uh, because that history is actually not so long as we think it is, and we're actually at, at risk of losing it uh, right now with the ecological and social crisis that we're confronting. Excellent. Well, is there anything you would like to add or anything else you'd like to say? Add that for those out there who are interested in Murray Bookchin's ideas and the things that he has had to say, uh, I would encourage you to also look at the philosophers who have influenced Murray Bookchin and uh, to look at some of Murray Bookchin's students, like the folks at the Institute, or to look at the Kurdish movement in uh, Southeast Turkey and Northern Syria, where they've been working very hard to put these ideas into practice. Uh, which is all to say that, uh, I want to add that Murray Bookchin's ideas are a culmination of so many different intellectual and social currents coming together. It's not just one man, it's a whole movement. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Eleanor. Uh, can you please tell the audience how uh, they can follow your work and learn more about your writings? Folks can be on the lookout for my forthcoming book, Practicing Social Ecology, through Pluto Press. Uh, that should be coming out next year. You can also follow me on my Twitter, which is Eleanor Finley. If folks would like to follow me, you can also look at my Twitter, which is at Eleanor Finley 16. You can also look at Roar Magazine, which is where uh, a number of my works have been published. That's roarmag.org. Uh, and you can find my essays there. You can also look at uh, an organization called MINIM, that's the uh, Municipalist uh, Observatory. Uh, I'll send you a link uh, to them as well. Um, and yeah, you can also see some of my writings on the Institute for Social Ecology's website. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Eleanor. It's been a pleasure, and thank you for sharing all your knowledge with us. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. It is truly my honor to, um, to be here speaking with you all. And uh, have a wonderful day. And hope to be in touch.